here are four more stories of Norse legends and myths. Please listen in a place where you can safely go to sleep. And if you like your stories without relaxing music, please look for the link in the pinned comments and the YouTube notes for that video. And let's begin. Sif's golden hair, how Loki wrought mischief in Asgard. All who dwelt in Asgard, the Asir and the Asnur, who were the gods and goddesses, and the Vanir, who were the friends of the gods and the goddesses, were wroth with Loki. It was no wonder they were wroth with him. For he had let the giant Thiassi carry off Iduna and her golden apples. Still, it must be told that the show they made of their wrath made Loki ready to do more mischief in Asgard. One day he saw a chance to do mischief that made his heart rejoice. Sif, the wife of Thor, was lying asleep outside her house. Her beautiful golden hair flowed all around her. Loki knew how much Thor loved that shining hair and how greatly Sif prized it because of Thor's love. Here was his chance to do a great mischief. Smilingly, he took out his shears and he cut off the shining hair. Every strand and every dress. She did not waken while her treasure was being taken from her. But Loki left Sif's head cropped and bare. Thor was away from Asgard. Coming back to the city of gods, he went into his house. Sif, his wife was there to welcome him. He called to Sif, but no glad answer came from her. To the palaces of all the gods and goddesses, Thor went, but to none of them did he find Sif, his golden-haired wife. When he was coming back to his house, he heard his name whispered. He stopped and then a figure stole out from behind a stone. A veil covered her head and Thor scarce knew that this was Sif his wife. As he went to her she sobbed and sobbed. O oh, Thor my husband she said, do not look upon me, I am ashamed that you see me. I shall go from Asgard and from the company of the gods and goddesses and I shall go down to Svalfheim and live amongst the dwarfs. I cannot bear that any of the dwellers in Asgard should look upon me now. O oh, Sif, cried Thor, what has happened to change you? I have lost the hair of my head, said Sif. I have lost the beautiful golden hair that you Thor loved. You will not love me any more, and so I must go away, down to Svlarvheim and to the company of the dwarves. They are as ugly as I am now. Then she took the veil off her head, and Thor saw that all her beautiful hair was gone. She stood before him, shamed and sorrowful, and he grew into a mighty rage. Who was it did this to you, Sif, he said. I am Thor, the strongest of all the dwellers in Asgard, and I shall see to it that all the powers the gods possess will be used to get your fairness back. Come with me, Sif. 
and taking his wife's hand in his, Paul went off to the council house where the gods and goddesses were. Sif covered her head with her veil, or she would not have had the gods and goddesses look upon her shorn head, but from the anger in Thor's eyes, all saw that the wrong done to Sif was great indeed. Then Thor told of the cutting of her beautiful hair, a whisper went round the council house. It was Loki did this, no one else in Asgard would have done a deed so shameful, one said to the other. Loki, it was who did it, said Thor. He has hidden himself, but I shall find him, and I will slay him. Nay, not so, Thor, said Odin, the father of the gods. Nay, no dweller in Asgard may slay another. I shall summon Loki to come before us here. It is for you to make him, and remember that Loki is cunning and able to do many things. Bring back to Sif the beauty of her golden hair. Then the call of Odin, the call that all in Asgard have to hearken to, went through the city of the gods. Loki heard it, and he had to come from his hiding place, and enter the house where the gods held their council. And when he looked on Thor, and saw the rage that was in his eyes, and when he looked on Odin, and saw the sternness in the face of the father of the gods, he knew that he would have to make amends for the shameful wrong he had done to Sif, said Odin. There is a thing that you, Loki, have to do. Restore to Sif the beauty of her hair. Loki looked at Odin. Loki looked at Thor. And he saw that what was said would have to be done. His quick mind searched to find a way of restoring to Sif the beauty of her golden hair. I shall do as you command, Odin, or father, he said. But before we tell you of what Loki did to restore the beauty of Sif's golden hair, we must tell you of the other things beside the gods and goddesses who were in the world at the time. First there was Vanir, when the gods, who were called the Azir, came to the mountain on which they built Asgard, they found other beings there. They were not wicked and ugly like the giants. They were beautiful and friendly. The Vanir, they were named. Although they were beautiful and friendly, the Vanir had no thought of making the world more beautiful or more happy, in that they differed from the Izir, who had such a thought. The Izir made peace with them, and they lived together in friendship, and the Vanir came to do things that helped the Izir to make the world more beautiful and happy. Freya, whom the giant wanted to take away with the sun and the moon, as the reward for building all the wall around Asgard, was of the Vanir, and the other beings of the Vanir were Frey, who was the brother of Freya, and Nidord, who was their father. On the earth below there were other beings, the dainty elves, who danced and fluttered about, attending to the trees and flowers and grasses. The Vanir were permitted to rule over the elves. Then below the earth in caves and hollows there was another race, the dwarfs or gnomes, like twisted creatures who were both wicked and ugly, 
but who were the best craftsmen in the world. In the days when neither the Azir nor the Vanir were friendly to him, Loki used to go down to Slavan, the dwarf's dwelling below the earth. And now that he was commanded to restore to Sif the beauty of her hair, Loki thought of help he might get from the dwarfs. Down, down through the winding passages, in the earth he went, and he came at last to where the dwarfs were most friendly to him, and they were working in their forges. All the dwarfs were master smiths, and when he came upon his friends, he found them working hammer and tongs, beating metals into shape. He watched them for a while and took note of the things they were making. One was a spear, so well balanced and made, that it would hit whatever mark it was thrown, at no matter how bad the aim the thrower had. The other was a boat that could sail on the sea, but that could be folded up so that it would go into one's pocket. The spear called Gungir, and the boat was called Skidbladnir. Loki made himself very agreeable to the dwarfs, praising their work and promising them things that only the dwellers in Asgard could give, things that the dwarfs longed to possess. He talked to them till the little ugly folk thought they would come to own Asgard and all that was in it. At last Loki said to them, Have you got a bar of fine gold that you can hammer into threads? Into threads so fine that they look like the hair of Sif, Thor's wife? Only the dwarves can make a thing so wonderful. Ah, there is the bar of gold. Hammer it into those fine threads, and the gods themselves will be jealous of your work. Flattered by Loki's speeches, the dwarfs were in the forge, took up the bar of fine gold, and flung it into the fire. Then taking it out, and putting it upon their anvil, they worked on the bar with their tiny hammers, until they beat it into threads that were as fine as the hairs of one head. But that was not enough. They had to be as fine as the hairs on Sif's head, and these were finer than anything else. They worked on the threads over and over again, until they were as fine as the hair on Sif's head. The threads were as bright as sunlight, and when Loki took up the mass of worked gold. It flowed from his raised hand down on the ground. It was so fine that it could be put into his palm, and it was so light that a bird might not feel its weight. Then Loki praised the dwarfs more and more, and he made more and more promises to them. He charmed them all. Although they were un unfriendly and a suspicious folk. And before he left them, he asked them for the spear and the boat he had seen them make. The spear Gungir and the boat Skidbladnir. The dwarfs gave him these things, though in a while, after they wondered at themselves for giving them. Back to Asgard Loki went. He walked into the council house where the dwellers in Asgard were gathered. He met the stern look in Odin's eyes and the rageful look in Thor's eyes with smiling good humour. Off with thy veil, O Sif, he said. And when poor Sif took off her veil, he put upon her shorn head the wonderful mass of gold he held in his palm. Over her shoulders the gold fell, fine, soft, and shining as her own hair, and the Asir and the Asnir 
the gods and the goddesses, and the Van and Varna, when they saw Sif's head covering again with shining web, laughed and clapped their hands in gladness. And the shining web held to Sif's head as if it indeed had roots, and was growing there. How Brock Brought Judgment on Loki It was then Loki, with the wish of making the Azir and the Vanir friendly to him once more, brought out the wonderful things he had gained from the dwarves. The Spear of Gungnir and the Boat of Skidbladnir the Asir and the Vanir marvelled at these things so wonderful. Loki gave the spear as a gift to Odin, and to Frey who was the chief of the Vanir, he gave the boat Sklidblanir. All Asgard rejoiced that things so wonderful and so helpful had been brought to them, and Loki, who had made a great show in giving these gifts, said boastingly, None but the dwarves who work for me could make such things. There are other dwarves, but they are as unhandy as they are misshapen. The dwarves who are my servants are the only ones who can make such wonders. Now Loki in his boastfulness had said such a foolish thing. There were other dwarves besides those who had worked for him, and one of these was there in Asgard. All unknown to Loki he stood in the shadow of Odin's seat, listening to what was being said. Now he went over to Loki, his little unshapen form, trembling with rage. Brock, the most spiteful of all the dwarves. Ha, Loki, you boaster, he roared. You lie in your words. Sindri, my brother, who would scorn to serve you, is the best smith in Svalvheim. The Azir and the Vanir laughed to see Loki, outfaced by Brock, the dwarf in the middle of his boastfulness. As they laughed, Loki grew angry. Be silent, dwarf, he said. Your brother will know about Smith's work when he goes to the dwarves who are my friends and learns something from them. He learned from the dwarves who are your friends. My brother Sindri learned from the dwarves who are your friends. Brock roared in a greater rage than before. The things you have brought out of Slavheim would not be noticed by the Azir and the Vanir if they were put beside the things that my brother Sindri can make. Sometime we will try your brother Sindri, and see what he can do, said Loki. Try now, try now, Brock shouted. I'll wager my head against yours, Loki, that his work will make the dwellers in Asgard laugh at your boasting. I will take your wager, said Loki. My head against yours. And glad will be I to see that ugly head of yours off your misshapen shoulders. The Azir will judge whether my brother's work is not the best that ever came out of Slavheim, and they will see it that you pay your wager, Loki, the head off your shoulders. Will ye not sit in judgment, O dwellers in Asgard? We will sit in judgment, said the Azir. 
then still full of rage, Brock the dwarf went down to Slavheim, and to the place where his brother Sindri worked. There was Sindri in the glowing forge, working with the bellows, an anvil, and hammers beside him, and around him, masses of metal, gold and silver, copper and iron. Brock told his tale, how he had wagered his head against Loki's, that Sindri could make things more wonderful than the spear and the boat that Loki had brought into Asgard. You were right in what you said, my brother, said Sindri, and you shall not lose your head to Loki but the two of us must work at what I am going to forge. It will be your work to keep the fire, so that it will neither blaze up, nor die down for a single instant. If you can keep the fire as I tell you, we will forge a wonder. Now brother, keep your hands upon the bellows and keep the fire under your control. Then into the fire Sindri threw not a piece of metal, but a pig skin. Brock kept his hands on the bellows working it, so that the fire neither died down, nor blazed up for a single instant. And in the glowing fire the pig skin swelled itself into a strange shape, but Brock was not left to work the bellows in peace. Into the forge flew a glad fire. It lightened up Brock's hands and stung them, and the dwarf screamed with pain. But his hands still held the bellows, working to keep the fire steady, for he knew that the glad fire was Loki and that Loki was striving to spoil Sindri's work. Again the gadfly stung his hands, but Brock, although his hands felt as if they were pierced with hot irons, still worked the bellows, so that the fire did not blaze up, or die down for a single instant. Sindri came and looked into the fire, over the shape that was rising there, he said words of magic. The gadfly had flown away, and Sindri bade his brother cease working. He took out the thing that could have been shaped in the fire and he worked over it with his hammer. It was a wonder indeed, a boar all golden that could fly through the air and that shed light from its bristles as it flew. Brock forgot the pain in his hands and screamed with joy. This is the greatest of wonders, he said. The dwellers in Asgard will have to give the judgment against Loki. I shall have Loki's head. But Sindri said, The bull golden bristle may not be judged as a great wonder, as the spear, Gungir, or the boat, Skidblanir. We must make something more wonderful still. Work the bellows as before, brother, and do not let the fire die down, or blaze up for a single instant. Then Sindri took up a piece of gold that was so bright, it lightened up the dark cavern that the dwarves worked in. He threw the piece of gold into the fire, 
then he went to make something else and left Brock to work the bellows. The gadfly flew in again. Brock did not know it was there until it lightened up the back of his neck. It stung him till Brock felt the pain was wrenching him apart. But still he kept his hands on the bellows, working it so that the fire neither blazed up nor died down for a single instant. When Sindri came to look into the fire, Brock was not able to speak for pain. Again Sindri said magic words over the gold that was being smelted in the fire. And he took it out of the glow and worked it over on the main anvil. And then in a while he showed Brock something that looked like the circle of their sun. A splendid armoring, my brother, he said. An armoring for a god's right arm. And this ring has hidden wonders. Every ninth night, eight rings like itself will drop from this armoring. This is Drapnir, the ring of increase. To Odin, the father of the gods, the ring shall be given, said Brock. And Odin will have to declare that nothing so wonderful or so profitable to the gods was ever brought into Asgard. O Loki, cunning Loki, I shall have thy head in spite of thy tricks. Be not too hasty, brother, said Sindri. What we have done so far is good. But better still, must be the thing that will make the dwellers in Asgard give the judgment that delivers Loki's head to thee. Work as before, brother, and do not let the fire blaze. The fire blaze up, or down for a single instant. This time, Sindri threw into the fire a bar of iron. Then he went away to fetch the hammer that would shape it. Brock worked the bellows as before, but only his hands were steady, for every other part of him was trembling with expectation of the gadfly's sting. He saw the gadfly dart into the forge, He screamed as it flew round and round him, searching out a place where it might sting him, most fearfully. It lighted down on his forehead, just between his eyes. The first sting it gave took the sight from his eyes. It stung again, and Brock felt the blood flowing down. Darkness filled the cave. Brock tried to keep his hands steady on the bellows, but he did not know whether the fire was blazing up or dying down. He shouted and Sindri hurried up. Sindri said the magic words over the thing that was in the fire. Then he drew it out. An instant more, he said, and the work would have been perfect. But because you let the fire die down for an instant, the work is not as good as it might have been. He took what was shaped in the fire to the main anvil and worked over it. Then when Brock's eyesight came back to him, he saw a great hammer. A hammer, all of iron. The handle did not seem to be long enough to balance the head. This was because the fire had died down for an instant. 
while it was being formed. The hammer is Molnir, said Sindri, and it is the greatest of all things that I am able to make. All in Asgard must rejoice to see this hammer. Thor only will be able to wield it. Now I am not afraid of the judgement that the dwellers in Asgard will give. The dwellers in Asgard will have to give judgement for us, Brock cried out. They will have to give judgement for us. And the head of Loki, my tormentor, will be given to me. No more wonderful or more profitable gifts than these have ever been brought into Asgard, Sindri said. Thy head is saved, and thou wilt be able to take the head of Loki, who was insolent to us. Bring it here and we will throw it into the fire, in the forge. The Azir and the Vanir were seated in the council house of Asgard, when a train of dwarves appeared before them. Brock came at the head of the train, and was followed by a band of dwarves, carrying things of great weight. Brock and his attendants stood round the throne of Odin, and hearkened to the words of the father of the gods. We know why you have come into Asgard from out of Slavheim, Odin said. You have brought things wonderful and profitable to the dwellers in Asgard. Let what you have brought be seen. Brock, if they are more wonderful and more useful than the things Loki has brought out of Slavheim, the spear of Gungir and the boat Skidbladnir, we will give judgment for you. Then Brock commanded the dwarves who waited on him to show the dwellers in Asgard the first of the wonders that Sindri had made. They brought out the ball, golden bristle. Round and round the council house the ball flew, leaving a track of brightness. The dwellers in Asgard said one to the other that this was a wonder indeed, but none would say that the ball was a better thing to have in Asgard than the spear that would hit the mark, no matter how badly it was flung, or the boat skid Bladnir that would sail on any sea that could be folded up so small that it would fit into anyone's pocket, none would say that golden bristle was better than these wonders. To Frey, who was chief of the veneer, Brock gave the wondrous ball. Then the attending dwarves showed the arm ring that was as bright as the circle of the sun. All admired the noble ring, and when it was told how every ninth night this ring dropped eight rings of gold that were like itself the dwellers in Asgard spoke aloud, all saying that Drovner, the ring of increase, was a wonder indeed. Hearing their voices raised, Brock looked triumphantly at Loki, who was standing there with his lips drawn closely together. To Odin, the father of the gods, Brock gave the noble arm ring. Then he commanded the attending dwarves to lay before Thor the hammer Molnir. Thor took the hammer up and swung it around his head. As he did, he uttered a great cry, and the eyes of the dwellers in Asgard 
lightened up when they saw Thor with the hammer Mjolnir in his hands. Their eyes lightened up and their lips came the cry, this is a wonder, a wonder indeed. With this hammer in his hand, none can withstand Thor, our champion. No greater thing has ever come into Asgard than the hammer Mjolnir. Then Odin, the father of the gods, spoke from his throne, giving judgment. The hammer Mjolnir that the dwarf Brock has brought into Asgard is a thing wonderful indeed and profitable to the gods. In Thor's hands it can crush mountains and hurl the giant race from the ramparts of Asgard. Sindri the dwarf has forged a greater thing than the spear Gungnir and the boat Skidbadnir. There can be no other judgment. Brock looked at Loki showing his gnarled teeth. Now Loki Yield your head, yield your head, he cried. Do not ask such a thing, said Odin. Put any other penalty on Loki for mocking you and tormenting you. Make him yield to you the greatest thing that is in his power to give. Not so, not so, screamed Brock. You dwellers in Asgard would shield one another, but what of me? Loki would have taken my head had I lost the wager. Loki has lost his head to me. Let him kneel down now till I cut us off. Loki came forward smiling with closed lips. I kneel before you dwarf, he said. Take off my head, but be careful. Do not touch my neck. I did not bargain that you should touch my neck. If you do, I shall call upon the dwellers in Asgard to punish you. Brock drew back with a snarl. Is this the judgment of the gods, he asked. The bargain you made, Brock, said Odin, was an evil one, and all its evil consequences you must bear. Brock in a rage looked upon Loki, and he saw that his lips were smiling. He stamped his feet and raged. Then he went up to Loki and said, I may not take your head, but I can do something with your lips that mock me. What would you do, dwarf? said Thor. So Loki's lips together, said Brock, so that he can do no more mischief with his talk. You dwellers in Asgard cannot forbid me to do this. Down, Loki, on your knees before me. Loki looked round on the dwellers in Asgard and saw that their judgment was that he must kneel before the dwarf. He knelt down with a frown upon his brow. Draw your lips together, Loki, said Brock. Loki drew his lips together while his eyes flashed fire. With then all that he took from his belt, Brock pierced Loki's lips. He took out a thong and tightened them together. Then in triumph the dwarf looked on Loki. Oh Loki, he said, you boasted that the dwarves who worked for you were better craftsmen than Sindri, my brother. Your words have been shown to be lies, and now you cannot boast for a while. Then Brock the dwarf with great majesty walked out of the council house of Asgard, and attending dwarfs marched behind him in procession. Down the passages, in the earth the dwarfs went singing the song of Brock's triumph over Loki, and in Slavine it was told forever, after how Sindri and Brock had prevailed. In Asgard now that Loki's lips were closed, there was peace and a respite from mischief. No one amongst the Zir or the Vanir was sorry that Loki had to walk about in silence, with his head bent low. How Freya gained her necklace, 
and how her loved one was lost to her. Yes, Loki went through Asgard silent and with head bent, and the dwellers in Asgard said one until the other, this will teach Loki to work no more mischief. They did not know that what Loki had done had sown the seeds of mischief, and these seeds were soon to sprout up and bring sorrow to the beautiful Vanna Freya, to Freya whom the giant wanted to carry off with the sun and the moon as payment for his building the wall around Asgard. Freya had looked upon the wonders that Loki had brought into Asgard, the golden threads that were Sif's hair, and Frey's boar that shed light from its bristles as it flew. The gleam of these golden things dazzled her, and made her dream in the daytime and the nighttime of the wonders that she might herself possess. And often she thought, what wonderful things the three giant women would give me if I could bring myself to go to them on their mountain top. Long ere this, when the wall around their city was not yet built, and when the gods had set up only the court with their twelve seats, and the hall that was for Odin, and the hall that was for the goddesses, there had come into Asgard three giant women. They came after the gods had set up a forge, and had begun to work metal for their buildings. The metal they worked was pure gold, with gold they built Gladsheim, the Hall of Odin, and with gold they made all their dishes and household ware. Then was the age of gold, and the gods did not grudge gold to anyone. Happy were the gods then, and no shadow, nor forbading, lay on Asgard, but after the three giant women, the gods began to value gold and to hoard it. They played with it no more, and the happy innocence of their first days departed from them. At last the three were banished from Asgard. The gods turned their thoughts from the hoarding of gold, and they built up their city and they made themselves strong. And now Freya, the lovely Vanir bride, thought upon the giant women, and on the wonderful things of gold they had flashed through their hands. But not to Odor, her husband. She did not speak her thoughts. For Odor, more than any of the other dwellers in Asgard, was wont to think of the days of happy innocence, before gold came to be hoarded and valued, Odor would not have Freya go near the mountain top, where the three had their high seat, but Freya did not cease to think upon them, and upon the things of gold they had, why should Odor know I went to them, she said to herself, no one will tell him, and what difference would it make if I go to them, and gain some lovely thing for myself? I shall not love Odor the less because I go my own way for once. Then one day she left their palace leaving Odor, her husband playing with their little children, Hanessa. She left the palace and went down to the earth. There she stayed for a while tending the flowers that were her charge. After a while she asked the elves to tell her where the mountain was on, which the three giant women stayed. The elves were frightened, and would not tell her, although she was queen over them. 
she left them and stole down into the caves of the dwarves. It was they who showed her the way to the seat of the giant women, but before they showed her the way, they made her feel shame and misery. We will show you the way if you stay with us here, said one of the dwarves. For how long would you have me stay, said Freya? Until the cocks and Svalheim crow, said the dwarves closing round her. We want to know what the company of one of the Vanir is like. I will stay, Freya said. And one of the dwarves reached up and put his arms round her neck and kissed her with his ugly mouth. Freya tried to break away from them, but the dwarves held her. You cannot go away from us until the cocks of Slavheim crow, they said. Then one and then another of the dwarves pressed up to her and kissed her. They made her sit down beside them on the heaps of the skins they had. When she wept, they screamed at her and beat her. One, when she would not kiss him on the mouth, bit her hands. So Freya stayed with the dwarfs until the cocks of Slavon crew. They showed her the mountain on the top, of which the three banished from Asgard had their abode. The giant women sat overlooking the world of men. What would you have from us, wife of Odor? One who was called Gullvig said to her, Alas, now that I have found you, I know that I should ask for naught, Freya said. Speak, Varna, said the second of the giant women. The third said nothing, but she held up in her hands a necklace of gold, most curiously fashioned. How bright it is, Freya said. There is shadow where you sit, women, but the necklace you hold makes brightness now. Oh, how I should joy to wear it. It is the necklace brings in the men, said the one who was called Gelvig. It is yours to wear, wife of Odor, said the one who held it in her hands. Freya took the shining necklace and put it around her throat. She could not bring herself to thank the giant women, for she saw there was evil in their eyes. She made reverence to them, however, and went down the mountain on which they sat overlooking the world of men. In a while she looked down and saw Bringsigman, and her misery went from her. It was the most beautiful thing ever made by hands. None of the Isner and none of the Verner possessed a thing so beautiful. It made her more and more lovely, and Odor she thought would forgive her when he saw how beautiful and happy Bringsigaman made her. She rose up from amongst the flowers and took leave of the slight elves and made her way to Asgard. All who greeted her looked long and with the wonder upon the necklace that she wore, and into the eyes of the goddesses there came a look of longing when they saw the necklace. But Freya hardly stopped to speak to anyone. As swiftly as she could make her way to her own place, she could show herself to Oda and win his forgiveness. She entered her shining palace and called to him. No answer came. Her child, the little Hanessa, was on the floor playing. Her mother took her in her arms, but the child, when she looked at the necklace, turned away crying. Freya left Hanessa down and searched again for Odor. He was not in any part of their palace. She went into the houses of all who dwelt in Asgard, asking for tidings of him. None knew where he had gone. At last Freya went back to their palace and waited for Odor to return. 
but Odor did not come. One came to her. It was the goddess, Odin's wife, the queenly Frigga. You are waiting for Odor, your husband, Frigga said. Ah, uh, let me tell you, Odor will not come to you here. He went when, for the sake of a shining thing, you did what would make him unhappy. Odor has gone from Elsgard, and no one knows where to search for him. I will seek him outside of Asgard, Freya said. She wept no more, but she took down the little child Hanessa and put her in Frigga's arms. Then she mounted her car that was drawn by two cats and journeyed down from Asgard to Midgard, the earth, to search for Adur, her husband. Year in and year out and all over the earth, Freya went searching and calling for the lost Odor. She went as far as the bounds of the earth, where she could look over to Jotunheim, where dwelt the giant who would have carried her off with the sun and the moon as payment for the building of the wall around Asgard. But in no place from the end of the rainbow Bifrost that stretched from Asgard to the earth, to the boundary of Jotunheim, did she find a trace of her husband Odor. At last she turned her car toward Bifrost, the rainbow bridge, that stretched from Midgard, the earth, to Asgard, the dwelling of the gods. Heimdall, the watcher for the gods, guarded the rainbow bridge, to him Freya went with her half hope fluttering in her heart. O oh, Heimdall, she cried, O oh, Heimdall, watcher for the gods, speak to me if you know what Odor is. Odor is in every place where the searcher has not come. Odor is in every place that the searcher has left. Those who seek him will never find Odor, said Heimdall, the watcher of the gods. Then Freya stood on Bifrost and wept. Frigga, the queenly goddess, heard the sound of her weeping, and came out of Asgard to comfort her. Ah, what comfort can you give me, Frigga, said Freya. What comfort can you give me when Odor will never be found by one who searches for him? Behold how your daughter, the child, Hanessa, has grown, said Frigga. Frey looked up and saw a beautiful maiden standing on the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge. She was young, more youthful than any of the Vanir or the Essenir, and her face and her form were so lovely that all hearts became melted when they looked upon her, and Freya was comforted in her loss. She followed Frigga across Bifrost the Rainbow Bridge and came once again into the city of the gods. In her own palace in Asgard, Freya dwelt with Hanessa, her child. She still wore around her neck the necklace that had lost her Odil, but now she wore it not for its splendor, but as a sign of the wrong she had done. She wept and her tears became golden drops as they fall on the earth, and by poets who know her story, she is called the beautiful lady in tears. How Frey won Gerda, the giant maiden, and how he lost his magic sword. Frey, chief of the Veneer, longed to have a sight of his sister, who had been from Asgard for so long. He must know that this happened during the time when Freya was wandering through the world, seeking her husband, the lost Odor. Now there was in Asgard a place from which one could overlook the world and have a glimpse of all who wandered there. 
That place was Hildlothsgarth, Odin's lofty watchtower. High up into the blue of the air that tower went, Frey came to it, and he knew that Odin Allfather was not upon the tower, only the two wolves, Jerry and Freki, that crouched beside Odin's seat at the banquet were there, and they stood in the way of Freya's entrance to the tower. But Frey spoke to Jerry and Freki in the language of the gods, and Odin's wolves had to let him pass. But as he went up the steps within the tower, Frey, chief of the Vanir, knew that he was doing a fateful thing, for none of the high gods, not even Thor, the defender of Asgard, nor Baldur, the best beloved of the gods, had ever climbed to the top of the tower and seated themselves upon the Allfather's seat. But if I could see my sister once, I shall be contented, said Frey to himself, and no harm shall come to me if I look out on the world. He came to the top of the tower. He seated himself on Odin's lofty seat. He looked out on the world. He saw Midgard, the world of men, with its houses and towns, its farms and people. Beyond Midgard he saw Jotunheim, the realm of the giants terrible with its dark mountains and its masses of snow and ice. He saw Freya as she went upon her wanderings, and he marked that her face was turned towards Asgard, that her steps were leading toward the city of the gods. I have contented myself by looking from the tower said Frey to himself, and no harm has come to me. But even as he spoke, his gaze was drawn to a dwelling that stood in the middle of the ice and snow of Jotunheim. Long he gazed upon that dwelling, without knowing why he looked that way. Then the door of the house was opened, and a giant maiden stood within the doorway. Frey gazed and gazed on her. So great was the beauty of her face, that it was like starlight in the dark land. She looked from the doorway of the house, then turned and went within, shutting the door. Frey sat on Odin's seat for long, then he went down the steps of the tower and passed by the two wolves, Jerry and Freki, that looked threatening upon him. He went through Asgard, but he found no one to please him in the city of the gods. That night did not come to him for his thoughts were fixed upon the loveliness of the giant maid he had looked upon, and when morning came he was filled with loneliness, because he thought himself so far from her. He went to the tower again, thinking to climb the tower and have sight of her once more, but the two wolves Jerry and Fracky bared their teeth at him and soon would not let him pass, although he spoke to them again in the language of the gods. He went and spoke to wise Neald his father, she whom you have may seen my son, said Neald, is Gerda, the daughter of the giant Gaimer, you must give over thinking of her, your love for her will be an ill thing for you, why should it be an ill thing for me, Frey asked, because you would have to give 
what which you prize most for the sake of coming to her. That which I prize most, said Frey, is my magic sword. You will have to give your magic sword, said his father, the wise Niord. I will give it, said Frey, loosening his magic sword from his belt. Bethink thee, my son, said Niord, if thou givest thy sword, what weapon wilt thou have in the day of Ragnarok, when the giants will make war upon the gods? Frey did not speak, but he thought the day of Ragnarok was far off. I cannot live without Gerda, he said, as he turned away. There was one in Asgard who was called Skinner. He was venturesome, being who never cared what he said or did. To no one else but Skinner could Frey bring himself to tell of the trouble that had fallen on him. The trouble that was punishment for his placing himself on the seat of the old father. Skinner laughed when he heard Frey's tale. Though a van in love with a maid of Juttenheim, this is fun indeed. Will you make a marriage of it? Would that I might even speak to her, or send a message of love to her, said Frey, but I may not leave my watch over the elves. And if I should take a message to Gerda, said Skinner the venturesome, what would my reward be? My boat, Skid Blabner, or my boar, Golden Bristle, said Frey. No, no, said Skinner, I want something to go by my side. I want something to use in my hand. Give me the magic sword you own. Frey thought upon what his father had said that he would be left weaponless on the day of Ragnarok, when the giants would make war with the gods, and when Asgard would be endangered. He thought about this and drew back from Skinir, and for a while he remained in thought. And all the time thick-set Skinir was laughing at him, out of his wide mouth and his blue eyes. Then Frey said to himself, The day of Ragnarok is far off, and I cannot live without Gerda. He drew the magic sword from his belt, and he placed it in Skinner's hand. I give you my sword, Skinner, he said. Take my message to Gerda, Gaima's daughter, and show her this gold and these precious jewels and say I love her, and that I claim her love. I shall bring the maid to you, said Skinner the venturesome. But how wilt thou get to Jotunheim, said Frey, suddenly remembering how dark the giant's land was, and how terrible were the approaches to it. Oh, with a good horse and a good sword one can get anywhere, said Skinner. My horse is a mighty horse, and you have given me your sword of magic. Tomorrow I shall make the journey. Skinner rode across by frost the rainbow bridge, laughing out of his wide mouth and his blue eyes at Heimdall, the warder of the bridge to Asgard. His mighty horse trod the earth of Midgard, and swam the river that divides Midgard, the world of men from Jotunheim, the realm of the giants. He rode on heedlessly and recklessly, as he did all things. Then out of the iron forests came the monstrous wolves of Jotunheim, to tear and devour him and his mighty horse. It was well for Skinner that he had in his belt Frey's magic sword. Its edge slew and its gleam frightened the monstrous beasts. 
On and on Skinnir rode on his mighty horse. Then he came to a wall of fire. No other horse but his mighty horse could go through it. Skinnir rode through the fire, and he came to the dale in which was Gaima's dwelling. And now he was before the house that Frey had seen Gerda enter on the day when he had climbed the tower, Odin's watchtower. The mighty hounds that guarded Gaima's dwelling came and bayed around him, but the gleam of the magic sword kept them away. Skinner backed his horse to the door and made his horse's hooves strike against it. Gaima was in the feast hall, drinking with his giant friends, and he did not hear the baying of the hounds, nor the clatter that Skinner made before the door, but Gerda sat spinning with her maidens in the hall. Who comes to Gaima's door? she said. A warrior upon a mighty horse, said one of the maidens. Even though he may be an enemy, and one who slew my brother, yet shall we open the door to him, and give him a cup of Gaima's mead, said Gerda. One of the maidens opened the door, and Skinner entered Gaima's dwelling. He knew Gerda amongst her maidens. He went to her and showed her the rich gold and the precious jewels that he had brought from Frey. These are for you, fairest Gerda, he said. If you will give your love to Frey, the chief of the Vanir, show your gold and jewels to other maidens, said Gerda. Gold and jewels will never bring me to give my love. Then Skinner, the venturesome, the heedless of his words, drew the magic sword from his belt and held it above her. Give your love to Frey, who has given me this sword, he said, or meet your death by the edge of it. Gerda, Gaima's daughter, only laughed at the reckless Skinner. Make the daughters of men fearful by the sharpness of Frey's sword, she said, but do not try to frighten a giant's daughter with it. Then Skinner, the reckless, the heedless of his words, made the magic sword flash before her eyes while he cried out in a terrible voice, saying a spell over her. Gerda, I will curse thee, yes, with this magic. Blade, I shall touch thee, such is its power, that like a thistle, withered, twill leave thee, like a thistle, the wind, strips from the roof. Hearing these terrible words and strange hissings, of the magic sword, Gerda threw herself on the ground, crying out for pity, but Skinner stood above her, and the magic sword flashed and hissed over her, Skinner sang, More ugly I leave thee, than maid ever was, thou wilt be mocked at by men and by giants, a dwarf only will wed thee, now on this instant, with this blade I shall touch thee, and leave thee bespelled. She lifted herself on her knees, and cried out to Skinner to spare her from the spell of the magic sword. Only if thou wilt give thy love to Frey, said Skinner. I will give my love to him, said Gerda. Now put up my magic sword and drink a cup of mead, and depart from Gaima's dwelling. I will not drink a cup of your mead, nor shall I depart from Gaima's dwelling, until you yourself say that you will meet and speak with Frey. I will meet and speak with him, said Gerda. When will you meet and speak with him, said Skinner? In the wood of the Barry. Nine nights from this, let him come and meet me there. Then Skinner put up his magic sword and drank 
a cup of mead that Gerda gave him. He rode from Geimer's house laughing aloud at having won Gerda for Frey, so making the magic sword his own forever. Skinner the venturesome, the heedless of his words, riding across Bifrost on his mighty horse, found Frey standing waiting for him beside Heimdall, the warder of the bridge to Asgard. What news dost thou bring me? cried Frey. Speak, Skinner, before thou dost dismount from thine horse. In nine nights from this, Thou must meet Gerda in Barry Wood, said Skinner. He looked at him laughing out of his wide mouth and his blue eyes. But Frey turned away, saying to himself, Long as one day, long, long too, can I live through nine long days. Long indeed were these days for Frey. But the ninth day came, and in the evening Frey went to Barry Wood, and there he met Gerda the giant maid. She was as fair as when he had seen her before the door of Geimer's house, and when she saw Frey so tall and noble looking, the giant's daughter was glad that Skinner the Venturesome had made her promise to come to Barry Wood. They gave each other rings of gold. It was settled that the giant maid should come as a bride to Asgard. Gerda came, but another giant maid came also. This is how that came to be. All the dwellers in Asgard were standing before the great gate, waiting to welcome the bride of Frey. There appeared a giant maid who was not Gerda, all in armour was she. I am Skadi, she said, the daughter of Thiassi. My father met his death at the hands of the dwellers in Asgard. I claim a recompense. What recompense would you have, maiden? said Odin smiling to see a giant maid standing so boldly in Asgard. A husband from amongst you, even as Gerda, and I myself must be let to choose him. All laughed aloud at the words of Skadi. Then said Odin laughing, We will let you choose a husband from amongst us, but you must choose him by his feet. I will choose him whatever way you will, said Skadi, fixing her eyes on Balder, the most beautiful of all the dwellers in Asgard. They put a bandage around her eyes, and the Azir and the Vanir seat in a half circle around her. She went by, she stooped over each, and laid hands upon their feet. At last she came to one whose feet were so finely formed that she felt sure it was Baldur. She stood up and said, This is the one that Skiddy chooses for her husband. And the Azir and the Vanir laughed more and more. They took the bandage off her eyes, and she saw not Baldur the beautiful, but Niord the father of Frey. But as Skadir looked more and more on Niord, she became more and more contented with her choice, for Niord was strong and he was noble looking. These two, Niord and Skadir, went first to live in Niord's palace by the sea, but the coming of the sea mew would waken Skadir too early in the morning, as she drew her husband to the mountain top where she was more at home. She would not live long away from the sound of the sea. Back and forward between the mountain and the sea, Skadi and Niord went, but Gerda stayed in Asgard with Frey. Her husband and the Azir and the Vanir came to love greatly Gerda, the giant maid.